I received an email from a gentleman named Bob with some um, some questions about one of my lessons that he's practicing on. Now, really, the questions that he has are probably questions that a lot of folks have had, and I know I've answered some of these questions from other folks in the past, so I thought I'd go ahead and put together this video to really kind of give you my philosophy or at least my answers and my feelings behind these questions. Now, let me give you just a little bit of background about Bob. Bob's a guitar player, and I know most of you are saxophone players, but these, uh, you know, there are a lot of folks that play guitar, piano, other instruments that work with these lessons. And so, you know, a lot of the questions they have are questions that everybody that's studying jazz improvisation would have. Now, Bob, like I mentioned, is a guitarist. He's been playing for a number of years. He's got a lot of experience under his belt, but he's looking to learn more about jazz improvisation. So he's using my lesson on soloing on tunes, Misty. Now, his questions are not specifically about that lesson, but really about the learning processes, at least as far as um, how my lessons are structured and how my philosophy towards the learning and those sorts of things. So I've got him, I've got his questions right here, and I'll probably take them one by one. But a lot of the less, a lot of the questions, the answers will kind of overlap. So if they do, then um, then I'll try to uh, abbreviate my answers to some of the questions to you know so to keep from being redundant. Now. Bob's first question is, why do those exercises? Now, the lesson has um, exercises in scales, arpeggios, how they work with the chord changes, those sorts of things, and also rhythmic exercises. He says, why not learn language by transcribing solos and parts of solos from the greats? And my answer to that is, sure, you learn, you, lo you learn a lot of language from transcribing from the greats. That's a big part of learning. And in fact, I even have a lesson series um, called From Licks to Language that's based on my Transcribe This Lick series. And I've got a bunch of Transcribe This Lick videos on YouTube if you want to check them out. But I think that's a big part of learning, transcribing licks and, uh, and taking them and applying them in your solo. But I also think that um, when you transcribe licks or when you do exercises, you're looking for conceptual learning rather than just lick learning. Now, the way I think about it, and I'm, you may have heard the analogy between learning to play jazz and learning a language, and I really believe that's a tremendous analogy. When you when you learn language, you learn words and uh, you learn how they function. A lot of the way you learn language, especially when you're a kid, is by listening and repeating. You know, so that's um that's kind of like transcribing and playing. But also, if when you get in school and you start getting a little bit more involved in learning to use language, then your teacher might give you vocabulary list and assignments like. Um, inserting words into sentences or creating sentences using certain vocabulary lists. You've probably got spelling lists when you're, when you're in school that you learn how your different words that you're using are, are spelled so that your language skills develop on a little bit more of an intellectual lang um, level and you're able to do more than just ask for the candy bar or where the restroom is. You're able to really kind of think complete sentences, think ahead in your speaking. The same thing applies to to jazz. Now you learn your you learn your licks, but you also learn your scales, your arpeggios, and you also there's another component about playing jazz. And and you know, language has rhythm. When you speak, you have rhythm. Otherwise, you stutter a lot and you don't make good complete sentences. But in jazz and playing music, we work in time. You know, so I'll give uh, assignments like um, uh, in my lessons include things like learning scales, arpeggios various components of the language, even musical embellishments and some of the lessons like um, like auxiliary tones and enclosures, things like that. And then uh, I also have exercises in working in time, you know, so I might give assignments like practicing rhythm um, with bits and pieces of the language in time. Now, that's not to say that when you improvise that you're taking these things and playing them exactly like that. That's not the point. The point is to develop fluency with your musical language so that you can create musical phrases that are not necessarily just licks or that may be influenced by your licks um, because a lot of times you can take those licks and practice them in a similar manner. You can take them into bits and pieces and get out the parts of the licks you like and how and really kind of analyze how they work and then practice them in a similar methodical manner so that you learn them in different keys, you learn them in different rhythms, all sorts of things. So I really think that learning licks 
is uh, learning and transcribing licks from solos and learning to play these exercises, learning your scales, learning about the timing of the changes and um, the various options like that. I think it all works hand in hand. Now let's continue. Bob's next question is what benefit do you feel is derived from doing these soloing exercises? Now I think uh, largely my answer to the first question helped cover this but you know again just having good fluency with your musical language is uh, the big benefit from doing these exercises. Whether it's knowing your scales and arpeggios or having good confidence in the time, you're able to play much more freely and much better as a result of doing these exercises that have these parameters, these limitations within them. So if you're working just time or just certain arpeggios or scales, you develop good skills, good creative skills with those with that limited vocabulary because by practicing within limits forces you to be creative within limits. It keeps you largely from going into some of the default ideas that you might commonly play. If you, if you limit yourself to only playing the things you're working on, you have to find ways to be creative with them. So let's move ahead. Do you feel there's a benefit to learning each exercise as perfectly as possible? Sure. Sure, um, I, think it's, um, I think it's important to learn exercise as well, but I also think it's important to keep your practice sessions or your, your personal practice evolving and moving forward. What you have to be careful about when you start working at learning everything perfectly, and I know this from working with folks, sometimes folks get stuck trying to perfect every little thing. Now, sometimes that's good, like I mentioned, but it can be an obsession that can keep you from moving ahead in your, in your, in your progress, and, uh, from, and it keeps you from evolving in your practice. And I also think sometimes people use that as a crutch. They, they, they'll come to me and they're, they're working on the same song for six months, you know, because they're afraid to move ahead. You know, and, and uh, I, I think just making sure that you spend adequate amount of time on something with the idea that you can come back and rotate through that in your practice again later, I think that's good. I know my practice, my personal practice, will include concepts, songs, ideas, whatever, that, I'm work, that I work on for a while, I move on to something else, then I come back a month later, two months later, whatever, maybe a year later, and work on that same stuff again. And it seems like the next time it cycles through my practice, I make better progress at it. So let's keep moving ahead. Do you feel it's important to be able to play them in time to a backing track or a metronome as opposed to just learning them? I think metronomes, backing tracks, these are very important tools in your practice. The, uh, the, I also think, though, sometimes it's good to practice things, get it under your hands, and then put it with the metronome because it can be frustrating if you're trying to learn notes at the same time that you're trying to learn time. You have to use a little personal discretion in this, um, but you don't want to end up working just on the vocabulary, the language, the exercise without doing it in time eventually because the time is the real key. You know, just like when you speak, it's important to have good timing in the way you deliver your sentences for them to make logic. You want to have good time with your music and we measure time a little bit more systematically in music sometimes than we do when we speak. So the metronome is a great tool. I really love the metronome even more than backing tracks because I feel like with the metronome I'm able to learn chord progressions, solo techniques, all of this more autonomously. You know, I can learn it without having to rely upon the rhythm section as a form of harmonic metronome. So I think the metronome is great practice, especially as you get a little bit more advanced and, uh, and you start being able to just kind of instinctively hear the chords in your mind. In fact, you want to hear the chords in your playing, even if you're a saxophone player, you want to have those kind of skills to be able to play the chords in time, okay? Let's move ahead. What are your thoughts about having a library of licks and practice inserting them into many different songs? Yes, I'm all for that. I think it's great to have licks. And again, like I mentioned earlier, I think it's good to conceptualize those licks um, so that you have bits and pieces from those licks that you can combine. 
But uh, one of the things that makes us sound like ourselves, one of part of part of developing our own personal sound, is having licks and ideas that kind of relate to us, you know? So just like we have certain catchphrases we say when we speak, sure, it's important to have licks. I just don't like the idea of basing your complete solo always on licks. Okay, let's keep going. What percent of practice time do you recommend to spend on doing these exercises and of course other exercises? This is where a lot of personal discretion comes into play. I think what's important in the practice room is that yes, you have these things that you're practicing, but it's also very important that you use a little self introspection to determine your personal weaknesses. I think the most important thing is that you balance your practice routine to put more weight on the areas that you're weak at. You know, whether that's ear training, whether that's time, whether that's vocabulary, whether that's repertoire. I think you have to use a lot of personal discretion in putting the most weight in your weak spots. You know, a teacher can help with that too. Um, but, um, but there's a lot that we can do on our own to really locate, identify, and focus and target on our weak areas. So these exercises, yeah, it's, it's important that you, that you work on them, especially if this is what you're working to improve at at the moment, okay? And now, Bob also, remember I mentioned that Bob is a guitarist, and he's worked on a solo arrangement of Here's That Rainy Day, and I'm assuming um, he probably meant a chord melody, I would think. Guitarists like to play chord melodies. Now, on saxophone, we don't play chord melodies, but um, let's see, he said some very good lines came his way, and he can't see how doing solo exercises would have helped him come up with lines for this. Now, here's my thought on that. I know when I write arrangements for saxophone groups, one of, the, one of the things I'll do to come up with free-flowing, spontaneous ideas is I'll practice improvising over the chord progression until I find lines that I like. And then that's how I usually find my best lines is by improvising in the practice. Then I can sit down and I can put my arrangements together um, and I think they're better arrangements than, I, than if I just sit there and try to write and write and write without having the free form playing. So I think all of these things, developing these improvisation skills, developing the ability to play in time through the changes with various ideas uh, available to me, um, helps when I put together arrangements. So. Hopefully these answers will help Bob and hopefully um, these are some answers to some questions you may have had. Okay, talk to you later.